Good morning. The first item of business is general questions, and we start with Fulton McGregor. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to tackle sectarian related crime. Minister Annabel Ewing. Sectarian related crime and the attitudes which underpin it have no place in modern Scotland. That is why we have made an unprecedented investment of £13 million since 2012 to address the issue. This has supported a wide range of work, including supporting, for example, Know by Mouth, which challenges sectarianism in our schools and also in private, public and third sector workplaces across Scotland. We continue to tackle sectarian attitudes through education and have worked closely with Education Scotland to deliver and roll out Scotland's first national educational resource on tackling sectarianism. In addition, presiding officer, I commissioned Lord Brackadale to conduct an independent review of existing hate crime legislation in Scotland, including that which tackles sectarianism. That is due to report shortly. Fulton McGregor. I thank the Minister for that response. The Minister will be aware of the recently reported incidents in Coatbridge where the Monstrance Blessed Sacrament in St Patrick's Church was vandalised and separately a local fast food shop owner became embroiled in online abuse between rival fans following last Sunday's Old Firm game. These incidents following an attack on the town cenotaph last year where graffiti left at the scene pointed to a sectarian element. Given that Parliament is likely to repeal the offensive behaviour at Football Bill later today, which admittedly is only one part of tackling sectarianism, what other proactive steps is the government taking to combat this problem which plights communities across Scotland, but particularly in the West and Central Belt? Minister. Yes, I, I am aware uh, of uh, the uh, terrible incident that occurred in Coat Bridge, uh, an act, presiding officer, of mindless vandalism, which was deeply offensive to the local community. This government is clear that any form of hate crime is totally unacceptable and will not be tolerated. We have been working consistently with communities to address attitudes that can lead to this sort of behaviour and we will continue to do so, I can say to Fulton McGregor. Of course, it takes time to change attitudes, but we are determined to continue to invest, uh, as we have been doing in many uh, groups who seek to work with communities to help uh, us to uh, move on from these attitudes of the past. And Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Is the Minister aware that while successive Scottish governments have put significant resources into tackling the symptoms of sectarianism, there's been an increase in religious hate crime during that period, with the latest figures showing that Roman Catholics were subject to more attacks than all other religious groups combined, and that this is an increasing trend? Will the Minister now accept Archbishop Tartaglia's words from some years ago when he said, and I quote, our problem is not so much sectarianism, but anti-Catholicism, and take targeted action to specifically address discrimination against Roman Catholics in Scotland. Minister. I can assure uh, Elaine Smith that we take the issue of religious bigotry in whatever form it takes very seriously indeed. It is unacceptable in 21st century Scotland. And we will continue to work with all churches and, and faith groups and others to uh, ensure that we are working together collectively to uh, further implement the recommendations of Dr Duncan Morrow vis-à-vis uh, uh, -vis his independent advisory group on tackling sectarianism in Scotland, uh, which recommendations I believe received uh, cross-party support. I would, of course, be happy to meet with Elaine Smith to discuss uh, this issue further if uh, she would wish. And question to Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what measures it is taking to ensure that disabled people are not disadvantaged by the ban of plastic swallows. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. Um, on the 7th of February uh, this year, during a parliamentary debate, I made it clear that we would ensure that a disability advisor would be appointed to the expert panel on single-use plastics, which we are already committed to putting in place. I'm, I'm not sure, I can't recollect whether the member was present at that debate. I'm happy to say, presiding officer, that I've now appointed Professor Kate Sang, Professor of Gender and Employment Studies at Harriet Watt University, to that position. She will advise on the implications for disabled people of all proposed action, including on plastic straws. Jeremy Balfour. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer? Uh, would you agree with me that for many disabled uh, people, paper alternatives have had a mixed response, as they often go soggy and give um, a very a taste that is not acceptable? Also, greener straws are often more expensive, and that uh, whatever scheme comes up, uh, people who require to use straws because of either disability or infirmity will not be financially penalised by any changes. 
Uh, well, of course, that is the purpose of the commitment that I have given in respect of making sure that all disability issues are taken on board when we're looking at items uh, that may be uh, under view in respect of action against single-use plastics. Um, I'm conscious, very conscious, that straws are not the only issue that might be out there. Um, and uh, uh, with each uh, one of the kinds of items, the categories of items that we're looking at, there may be very specific uh, concerns. Um, there may also be potential solutions to be had from the disabled community, which was an issue that Kate Sang uh, raised with me in her comments uh, uh, when I was speaking to her earlier this week. Um, so I absolutely uh, agree with what the member is saying, that uh, nothing we do uh, will uh, negatively impact on the disabled community, and we will be looking very hard for solutions and alternatives in the period between now uh, and any action that might be taken in regard to plastic straws. Question number three, Stuart Stevenson. To ask the Scottish Government how many community asset transfers there have been since the Community Empowerment Scotland Act 2015 came into force, and how this compares with the numbers prior to that. Cabinet Secretary, Angela Constance. Thank you, President Officer. The first annual report since the asset transfer part of the Community Empowerment Act came into force last year are due by the end of June 2018. Until that time, we will not know how many asset transfers under the Act have taken place across Scotland. Uh, we will be undertaking an evaluation of asset transfers in early summer this year, and this will tell us the numbers involved and also provide more detail on the experiences of community bodies uh, and the impact of the Act. Uh, we are unable to compare with previous numbers as we do not hold information on the number of asset transfers that took place before the Act came into force. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, is the Minister aware of the Tory Independent uh, Council in Murray's plans to dispose of halls in Bucky, Finechty and Cullen and elsewhere uh, in Murray? Uh, the communities would like to acquire these halls and take them on, but the Council appears to be very reluctant to provide uh, adequate support to them in a very short period of time over which this might have to be done. Is that something that will usefully inform the operation uh, of the Community Empowerment Act? Because it does appear to fall short of the intention uh, of that Act. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, uh, Mr Stevenson raises an important point. I agree that for community empowerment and asset transfer to work, that there needs to be help and support uh, provided to community bodies, uh, including help and support uh, from local authorities. He may be interested to know that the Scottish Government funds the Community Ownership Support Service to support community-based groups in Scotland uh, to take a stake in or ownership of previously publicly owned land or buildings. And the Community Ownership Support Service have an active presence uh, in uh, Mr Stevenson's um, area and offer individual uh, community groups and public bodies with a, a very bespoke uh, support service. And I could, if Mr Stevenson wishes, put him and or his constituents uh, in touch with the uh, Community Ownership uh, Support Services, if that would be helpful. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Councils have long had the chance to transfer buildings and land into community ownership. The benefits of transfer are clear, community empowerment, local people, and asset disposal for local authorities. What reassurances can the Cabinet Secretary give to this Parliament that the Scottish Government has carried out recent assessments which outline the short-term benefits compared to the long-term commitments which transfer can bring? Cabinet um, I think Mr Stewart raises um, also an important point because the whole raison d'etre of the Community uh, Empowerment Act was to create opportunities for communities uh, on their own terms, uh, not terms that are enforced by statutory bodies, but on their own terms to be proactively involved in improving outcomes uh, on the issues uh, that matter uh, most to them and for them uh, where they choose to become involved um, in issues uh, that need to be addressed. Uh, and it's also about enabling those community voices um, to, at a grassroots level to have that response uh, from the ground up, uh, given that the evidence shows uh, uh, of the, the value about locally led uh, solutions. As I said in my original answer to uh, Mr. Uh, Stevenson, uh, the first annual reports um, 
will be uh, produced uh, later on this year. Uh, that will give us uh, valuable information about the progress of the Act uh, at a local level that will enable uh, the Scottish Government uh, to take further steps in evaluating uh, the overall progress of the Act, in particular with regards to improving community outcomes and reducing inequality at a local level. Ivan McKee. Uh, thank you, uh, President Officer. Um, the Greater Easter House Alcohol Awareness Project and North East Carers have been based in Trondra Place in my constituency for over 20 years. Last October, they submitted a community asset transfer request. This was refused because the site is owned by Jobs and Business Glasgow and Alio, and thus exempt from the Act. The organisations are now also under threat of eviction by Jobs and Business Glasgow. The government can make individual bodies subject to asset transfer provisions by bringing forward an order. Will the Cabinet Secretary undertake to look into this situation and consider whether an order would be appropriate in this case to enable these organisations to stay in their current premises? Cabinet Secretary. I'm very keen in this instance to under, understand more about the situation that Mr uh, McKee uh, describes and I will ask my uh, officials to investigate uh, further uh, and I would endeavour to keep uh, Mr McKee uh, fully updated as well. I mean what is and isn't possible in terms of alios uh, is very much dependent on the legal forum um, of the, the alio but I'll endeavour to investigate matters further uh, and report back to Mr McKee. And question for Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the Scottish Fuel Poverty Strategic Working Group regarding cold weather payments. Minister Jean Freeman. Thank you, <coughs> thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Fuel Poverty Strategic Working Group was a short-term uh, independently chaired group uh, convened between November 2015 and 2016. The issue of cold weather payments uh, was discussed a number of times at uh, that group's meeting and the minutes were published on the Scottish Government website. The group published a report in October 2016 which included recommendations relating to cold weather payments and both this report and the Scottish Government's response are available online and we will be mindful of those recommendations as we develop our approach to cold weather payments when that benefit is devolved. Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank, I thank the Minister for that answer. And could I please ask her uh, that when she's having further discussions about the devolution of this benefit and considering the implementation, that she recognises that for East Kilbride, which everyone knows is a very cold part of the country, um, in the calculation of cold weather payments, it's from Bishopton Weather Station, which is highly inappropriate and disadvantages those on pension credits in East Kilbride who should in fact have that entitlement. Minister Jean Freeman. Uh, I thank Ms Fabiani for that uh, additional question. Of course, East Kilbride, as she says, is colder than uh, perhaps the weather station uh, that applies to it. But like many communities, um, I'm sure it is cold but has a warm heart. The way that this works at the moment is that the current agreement is between the Department of Work and Pensions and the Met Office, which provides each postcode area to be allocated to one of 94 weather stations which cover all parts of Scotland, England and Wales. There are a range of issues and difficulties that have been raised with me from communities and indeed individual members with respect to how cold weather payments operate in Scotland and we will be taking all of those into account as we develop our approach to that benefit and its delivery uh, as we move to take responsibility for it. And Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. It, as the Minister has set out, current eligibility for cold weather payments is based on weather station mapping and can produce some absurd results, as we've already heard. I've been told of households in Coatbridge and Bells Hill receiving just two payments due to the use of the Bishopton weather station, where residents in Airdrie and Holytown have just received their fourth. And for people living in towns and sometimes houses right next to each other, um, the cost on the Coatbridge side was £50 this year. Um, it's sometimes the difference between heating and eating. And can the Minister give the assurance that cold spell um, heating assistance regulations rely on localised forecasts rather than the postcode to weather station mapping the, D the DWP use at present? Minister. 
Well, of course, Mr. Griffin reinforces the point I'm making, that we understand these difficulties and differences. There are other issues around uh, cold weather payments, not least uh, factors around wind chill factor and so on. So it's not simply the, the uh, actual temperature as it's recorded, but other factors that play a part, which affect some of our more rural and indeed island communities. So we're mindful of that. However, we do need to uh, identify how we will best get the robust data that would trigger those payments, taking account of the points that both Mr Griffin and indeed Ms Fabiani uh, have made. And so that is what I mean when I say we are mindful of these issues. They've been raised with me many times by uh, local communities. I'm uh, clear about the importance of them, but we need to work through the basis on which we would secure the data uh, as a source uh, Social Security Service in Scotland in order to trigger those payments because what we don't want, of course, is to have such a complicated system that people are then uh, in return having to wait too long in order to receive that support. So we'll work those matters through uh, and would happily discuss that with members in due course. Question number five, Gordon MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government how much it has invested in the Schools for the Future programme since 2011. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presiding officer, since 2011-12, through the Schools for the Future programme, the Scottish Government has provided £269.6 million in capital investment and £41.6 million in revenue investment. Gordon MacDonald. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Edinburgh Council is proposing to close and amalgamate two high schools in my constituency, Curry Community High and Wester Hills Education Centre, on a new site causing great concerns amongst parents at both schools. Parents wish that the schools in the area be refurbished on their existing locations. Under the Schools for the Future pro pro programme, what proportion of rebuilding or refurbishing costs is met by the Scottish Government and how much of the current wave of funding to March 2020 is unallocated? Cabinet Secretary. Um, first of all, the issues that uh, Mr Macdonald raises in relation to this, the two schools of Curry Community High School and Wester Hills Education Centre are issues for the City of Edinburgh Council to consider. In relation to the Schools for the Future programme, it's a shared funding programme between national and local government. The Scottish Government provides two-thirds of funding support to all secondary school projects and 50% funding support to primary school projects. The programme is fully commi committed at the present moment, supporting 117 school projects across Scotland. Question number six, Gordon Lindhurst. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to reduce antisocial behaviour. Minister Annabel Ewing. The Antisocial Behaviour Scotland Act 2004 provides a wide range of measures for dealing with all forms of antisocial behaviour. Our national strategy is based on prevention, early intervention and diversionary activities. The Scottish Government is currently working with a group of local authorities to use their expertise and knowledge to inform, refresh and update all of the guidance documents on tackling antisocial behaviour. Gordon Linders. Um, I thank the Minister for that answer. In 2016 to 17, nearly 900 incidents of antisocial behaviour were reported every day to the police in Scotland. Uh, that was an increase on the total by something like 10,000 from the year before. And antisocial behaviour is something that features in my casework quite commonly. And in Edinburgh, it was a 3% rise in that year period. Despite this, we've seen a 50% reduction in fixed penalty notices during the same period. Um, does the minister see fixed penalty notices as a valuable tool for the police? Uh, and can she explain the trend? Minister. Uh, what I would say to the member is, of course, that there are a number of, of powers available to uh, uh, relevant authorities to deal with antisocial behaviour, depending on the nature of the antisocial behaviour and fixed penalties uh, form part of that uh, suite of uh, powers. They are a quick way of dealing with certain uh, levels of antisocial behaviour. Uh, I don't have the detailed statistics that the member cited in his question in front of me, but I do arrange to look into that uh, and get back to the member. Of course, we do have to remember that whilst, of course, antisocial behaviour uh, is of extreme irritation to many of our constituents uh, across Scotland, I know that myself from my own uh, at case at uh, work. At the same time, in terms of antisocial behaviour related crimes, uh, those in fact uh, are continuing to fall. So I, I think we have to look at the picture in the round, but I do undertake to uh, write to the member vis-a-vis -vis the specific issue about the current uh, statistics on fixed uh, penalty notices. 
We'll try squeezing question seven. Ruth McGuire. To ask the Scottish Government how it supports social landlords in providing affordable housing that is allocated according to need. Cabinet Secretary Angela Constance. Sign officer, the Scottish Government provides guidance to support local social uh, landlords to develop allocation policies which comply with the legal framework for allocations and which meet the needs of their communities. Ruth McGuire. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. This year, along with the usual yearly rent increases, some of my constituents are facing additional increases due to a rent restructure and will be paying an additional 6% rent for no obvious additional service. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that whilst social landlords like Irvine Housing Association have a responsibility to maintain a sustainable business model, this must not ignore the real life experience of their tenants, many of whom have seen no or little increase in their wages, and that any increase or restructure should take account of the impact of rent rise on all tenants, including those on low income who aren't eligible for a housing benefit. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, uh, all social landlords uh, must understand the importance of keeping rents uh, affordable and meeting the needs of the people that they serve. Uh, landlords need to demonstrate transparency in how rents are calculated and set them in a, a consistent and transparent way uh, across their stock. They must uh, also not increase rents uh, without regard of affordability. Uh, and while the Scottish Government does not direct individual social landlords on setting rent levels for their tenancies, uh, but those landlords have a legal duty to consult with their tenants and register tenant organisations on matters which significantly affect them, such as rent setting and restructuring. Thank you. That concludes general questions. We turn now to First Minister.